So yeah, let's speak a bit uh, uh, about DNS. So we named our talk DNS on Fire, and we worked during a couple of uh, months uh, on DNS hijacking. And uh, uh, we would expose you to different groups and to different research we did on this uh, unique topic. So shortly, my name is uh, Paul Rascagnier. I'm French, uh, as you can hear. And uh, I'm a security researcher at Cisco Talos. And if you are used to reverse some binary, it's when I have to reverse Delphi or, or VB. And my colleague. Hello, uh, I'm Warren Mercer, security researcher with Paul. Uh, Paul and I are like a work wife, work husband, because pretty much everywhere we go, we, we seem to go together. So we've, we've worked on a lot of stuff similarly together. So as Paul says, we're going to talk today about two distinct groups doing uh, DNS hijacking and DNS redirection. So we do have an agenda. We don't always, but we do today. Um, so we're going to go really briefly through like DNS protocol and what DNS hijacking is. I do presume that most people in the room are familiar, but we'll just do a very quick, literally like two minutes of your time. Um, so DNS protocol, DNS hijacking. Well, what is DNS? It's essentially how you get from google.com to 1.2.3.4, so the IP address that actually hosts that infrastructure or that server. Obviously, it's much easier to remember google.com than it is any of those um, series of IP addresses. So this is essentially what DNS does. Your endpoint will do a lookup to local DNS server. If it knows how to find it, it will tell you where to go. That's it, you're done. If it doesn't, it will then maybe visit a, a TLD server somewhere else or a root server somewhere else. And essentially what happens is that platform comes back and says, this is how you get to this location. So again, very simple. It's commonly referred to as the telephone book of the internet. Um, now DNS redirection, however, slightly different. You do send out your request, for example, .com or google.com. DNS server does respond back to, but when you're doing redirection and DNS hijacking, generally you'll have taken a point round about here where you then send different traffic back, so different information back. So some places where that can happen, uh, the DNS chain of custody exists along various paths. So you've got your DNS administrator, so if anyone in the room manages a DNS server for a Windows environment, you would be a DNS administrator. Uh, you've got DNS system interfaces, things like bind, local host service boxes, etc. Uh, DNS servers that you run in your network, other network infrastructure, maybe your switch access, your DNS proxy, etc. Uh, DNS server, again, that you might have locally or you might have somewhere else. And then the endpoint, again, when you think like host files. So you have so certain different areas along the way that an attacker could really hit in and get into being able to cause DNS redirection or DNS hijacking. Uh, this is not a new threat. Uh, it's been going on earliest sort of public information about it was the Iranian Cyber Army. They performed DNS redirection on Twitter, right down to 2016, where we've seen uh, blockchain on info, DNS hijack, and again, it was for uh, credential harvesting for then Bitcoin transaction theft. So how did we start? I'm going to let Paul talk about this. Yeah, just before starting, I, I saw some faces in the room, so I'm, we apologize for Warren accent. <laughs> he, he's not a native English speaker, so... <laughs> so I keep being told, which I am. <laughs> So, yeah, the first actor we work on and we discover uh, DNS hijacking, we named this case DNS espionage. And in fact, I'm not really into network. It's not historically my job to, even if I work for Cisco, you know. Uh, I'm more about malware and I analyze malware. And malware, it's, it's my, my daily job, more or less. So as usual, everything starts by malware and we discovered a, a campaign starting by a malicious document, so malicious document uh, sent by spear phishing emails or sent by uh, social media such as LinkedIn. So, uh, and the, the attackers registered domain, like this two example, hr-wipro, hr suncore and Wipro and Suncore are two real company. And the guy simply buy a domain with HR in, in front. And if you go directly on hr.wipro.com, it's redirect to wipro.com. So it doesn't really look like malicious, but it is malicious. Here is uh, an example of LinkedIn uh, contact. Yeah, it's a screenshot from uh, Open Minded. Uh, the guy is somewhere here. Nah. And uh, you can see a discussion between uh, uh, HR uh, people. Saying, yeah, please uh, read and fill this document uh, if you are looking for a new job. And if you look at the link, it's hr.wipro.com, and the malicious document in is at the at the end of the the URL. 
So it's something uh, today. If you, I think every uh, company is doing uh, uh, phishing campaign for for to to as awareness for users. And you say don't click on link you send by email, blah blah blah. But I think nobody do this kind of task on, on LinkedIn. You don't use, uh, you don't make any campaign using LinkedIn, uh, training users to don't click on link on, on LinkedIn. And as it uses HTTPS, you cannot really, uh, monitor LinkedIn communication, etc. So it's pretty clever from, from the attacker's point of view. So the domain, the URL, uh, where the document was, uh, located. Nothing really amazing, a classical document with, uh, malicious macro inside. This document is a real one. So the attackers go on the real Suncar website, check if there is a, a form, take the form and simply add the macro on it. So this document can be downloaded without the macro, of course, on Suncar website. So what is the purpose of all this, this stuff? Uh, the macro deploy the malware on the machine and the, mach the malware is executed. The malware supports two kinds of protocols. The first one is HTTP. Very common. Almost all the malware use HTTP or HTTPS and DNS tunneling, which is not something new, but something less common than uh, HTTP. In terms of uh, features, nothing really amazing. It is able to download file, upload file, execute command, and uh, we are lucky because uh, the developers are uh, not really good. And the, pro the first sample we discovered contained a uh, debug. So it generates a log.txt with everything in here. So we were able to see the executed command, the output, what was sent to the attackers, etc. The only missing part was a timestamp. So how it works, basically, uh, here I'm going to speak about the HTTP mod. He perform a DNS request to register the new machine. It's uh, the example you have. And in this uh, case, the attackers use Office 360, but with a zero at the beginning and an O at the end. And yeah, he simply registered to, to, to CC to server saying, oh, I'm compromised and what's, what's, what's next? So each target have a unique ID. So the attackers is able to say, okay, if I've got this uh, request from this, uh, with this specific uh, subdomain, it means this, this uh, target. And they have a really small protocol to say, for example, I don't have any configuration file, et cetera, et cetera. So nothing really, really amazing. And um, the purpose is to connect to a, a web page. This web page was a fake Wikipedia. So if you go on the, on the C2 server, you have a kind of uh, Wikipedia homepage. But if you look at the source code, you have commentary, comments, sorry. And it's, uh, in fact, base64 command, uh, encoded uh, in, in base64. The malware support custom dictionary. So in this example, uh, it's a, uh, it's a custom dictionary, I think. And the commands are really simple. The first one was to, get the username. The second one was to get the host name. And the third one was to get the domain uh, of the machine. As we were lucky, it was in debug. So we simply have to check the log file. And we have the received command and the send uh, output. Really, really easy. So the other part is there is a DNS mode. So how it works, it only used DNS in this case, no HTTP request, no HTTPS request. How it works, it's really, really straightforward. So the malware performs DNS requests and the server reply an IP. It's the purpose of DNS, you know, ask for a DNS, retrieve an IP. And if you look at this IP, you look at uh, the ASCII code of each digit and 100 is D, 105 is I, 114 is R and zero is end of line. So the C2 simply reply to the infected machine saying execute dir. That's all. If the attackers want to execute longest command, he's limited by the number of, uh, of, uh, number on inside of an IP. Uh, the malware simply wait for the last, uh, backslash zero. And so he receives the command dir list the directory, uh, the file here, and the malware reply by a DNS. And if you look at the beginning, it is sent, uh, I don't know, four characters by four characters, the uh, output of DIR, and everything is sent to, to the attackers. Yeah. 
So we start to check in our telemetry to, to, to know, uh, for example, we have open DNS Cisco umbrella, so we have a good visibility concerning uh, DNS. And we saw that mainly all the requests were from Middle East. So it target mainly uh, Middle East except few, few exceptions. And yeah, so you are speaking about DNS hijacking. Uh, the talk is about DNS hijacking. You speak a lot about malware, about HTTP, about DNS, but what's the point? Here is the infrastructure used by, by the attackers. And we discovered that on one of these IP, we had a lot of .gov, dot a country, a domain. So one of these IP was used by the attackers to exfiltrate data. But few weeks before, it was used to point to a uh, government uh, email gateway, VPN gateway, etc. from uh, a couple of countries located in, in, in Middle East. If we check on a uh, certificate transparency project, we can see that at the same time, Let's Encrypt certificates were created. So the guy creates a redirect DNS and create Let's Encrypt certificate at the same time. What's the purpose? In this case, he's doing DNS redirection, saying, okay, instead of going to this IP for your VPN gateway or this IP for your uh, mail gateway, you will go to my IP. And he's doing man in the middle by using Let's Encrypt. So I started to look on our log and telemetry and check uh, since how many times he's doing this game. And I discovered a lot of uh, DNS redirection in September, October, November last year. Uh, we, we identify a couple of, uh, of stuff and I decided to check, uh, longer in the past to know, yeah, okay, maybe he's doing this game for a long time and we didn't, uh, get it. And I discovered few redirection, uh, long time before. The oldest one we identify was at the beginning of 2017. But it doesn't mean it started at the beginning of 17. It's simply we don't have log before. So maybe he's doing that for, for a lot of years. But the point is at the beginning, it was really, really rare. Only few per years. And he become more and more aggressive and, uh, did more and more redirection like at the end of the year. And it's at this time that, uh, we discovered this, uh, this activity. So the purpose in this case was really to redirect, uh, uh, police VPN, email, intel agency, private company, and stuff like that. Mainly VPN gateway and mail server. So when the guy, when the employee connect to the mail server, instead of going on the real one, he go on the fake one. And we think after redirection was performed to the real one. And at this time, he was able to intercept email, if it's a mail server, or credential, or token, or whatever. We identify more than 25 redirection since the beginning of 2017. And with a large peak last year, that's how we discover it. We have more than 10 country. I think nine, con no, eight countries are located in Middle East and two countries located in uh, Europe and USA, but it's a secondary target. So, uh, the, they didn't really care about this European country, but it was more uh, for the operation in Middle East. And public and private sector. 90% public, 10% private sector, more or less. So it's really, really about uh, public sector. So we published this like April last year, um, March, April last year. Um, then an oil rig leak came out. Uh, so supposed Iranian... Um, hacking group APT34, I think, whatever we call it nowadays, everything gets 15 names, as we all know. Um, so oil rig is the name we use because that was one of the first that were discovered. So it's the name we used. Um, again, allegedly Iranian. The really interesting thing about this leak is it, it gave out some of their tools and interestingly, some of their panels. Uh, so what we were able to do is we started looking into this leak when it came out. Like I said, we published DNS when I was only weeks, maybe a month max before this. Uh, there's nothing here related to DNS espionage, but another piece of malware Paul and I discovered called Kharkov, which was very similar to DNS espionage, <clears throat> we found uh, sort of links to. So we started looking into it. Uh, obviously, that might be hard to see, but if you can see the country just along here, uh, just over there for this side, uh, obviously the countries we mentioned were all very specific to the Middle East. 
these were all in Lebanon. Uh, this panel, we eventually found out to be the DNS Espionage stroke Kharkov panel. So that's how we were able to link this back. So the panel is called Scarecrow. And obviously the victimology matches perfectly. Uh, there is a country there called France, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. Uh, I just wanted to point out that was not Paul or I. <laughs> I'm lucky enough to not be from France, but Paul is. But that was not Paul. That was just a an, an overlap. Uh, we knew who it was, but it was just an overlap in this in this screenshot we were able to get hold of. So that obviously filled in some of the blanks that we were able to look at. We then started looking at some of the the more um, source code related to the panel. And Paul has this weird, unique ability to remember everything, and I, I do mean everything. So this panel was a panel used for DNS espionage. Uh, this was credited that last line, I think, discovered this, wasn't it? No, this one is a screenshot you just uh, Yeah, so this is the screenshot of the leak, sorry. Uh, so the panel name there says this was panel, obviously with some character replacements and uh, things like that. So that was really interesting to us because that's some of the panel overlaps that we saw. Last line then went public with um, a Django misconfiguration that existed on one of the, the C2 servers for DNS espionage. You notice the panel name is pretty similar. So this was panel to this is panel. Obviously, Paul and I are not going to say that that's a great way to link it, but when we start to look at all the other telemetry and the data that we have, we can start to use this as an overlap to say, yes, we do believe that this was related to oil rig stroke APT34. And I mean, simple things like this was panel and this is panel, they're interesting to pick up for us as a research community, because you can now go off and look at those IOCs within your infrastructure. If you see this was panel or this is panel being used or redirected within your company, there's a fair chance that you had DNS espionage malware on your infrastructure. Um, so what else came out of this leak was really interesting that we found was a framework that they called Webmask, say they, APT34 oil rig. Um, this was a framework that was specifically designed to do man in the middle via DNS redirection, aka DNS espionage. Uh, used ICAP for some proxy pass-through stuff and used Squid Proxy and then CertBot. So everything that you would need to possibly carry out DNS redirection or DNS hijacking, you had wrapped up in this cute little thing called Webmask. So because the leak was obviously all of the information and, and the panel information, things like that, we were able to look at uh, the actual Python scripts and bash scripts that were provided to users, um, possibly related to APT34 oil rig actors. And this basically is a rundown of what to do to get this to work. Uh, you'll notice here that these are some domains. Uh, again, sorry over there. These are some domains that relate very much to the Middle East area that Paul and I mentioned. Uh, we're not going to say for sure if they were used or not, but that was within the oil rig leak that, was, um, that came out. Obviously, we don't discuss victims or attribution in that way, but, I mean, you can draw some of your own conclusions there when you've got a a step-by-step -step guide, as it will, to set up a DNS redirection campaign. Uh, and then, furthermore, the ICOP proxy stuff. So again, just a Python script to do ICOP via proxy pass-through. So uh, again, everything there that you want to know, things like credentials to pick up, cookie files to grab, injected information for files, header files. Again, everything you would possibly need to do redirection. So yeah, we're not 100% sure that Webmask was used for, but... I mean, when you look at the overlaps in the TTPs that go with it, you look at the panel information, you look at the victimology, you look at the targeting, you look at the actual idea behind Webmask. Web mask. We're going to go with maybe, because again, Cisco don't like to publicly attribute or comment on victims, but we'll go with maybe and you guys can draw your own conclusion. So that wraps up the espionage and uh, the overlap with oil rig. So the second thing we're going to talk about today is sea turtle. And it's important to point out this is similar TTPs, but distinctly a very different actor. Um, this is the A-team. This actor is very good at what they do. They're very skilled. They're very precise. They're very determined. Uh, they're all of those good words that the buzzword journalists like to use when we talk about sophisticated actors. This is these guys. So what do they do? Um, clear primary motive, motive for everything that they targeted was espionage. These are not guys who want to say, oh, we would love to take your credit card information. They are guys that would say, we'd love to know how you built your nuclear power plant because we would like one of those. So this is the kind of stuff that these guys are going for. Um, clear legend of primary targets and victims that we'll, we'll see on, on a map that we've got. Middle Eastern, uh, North African government departments. So again, you see that slight overlap with DN espionage as well. Intelligence agencies and government agencies. So again, intelligence agencies and government agencies within the Middle East region. Oil and gas, 
Middle East that comes hand in hand, and then military targets. Again, these guys want to know how your rockets are created, not where you want to fire them. Uh, we believe this to be a state-sponsored attack, as we mentioned there. Uh, we believe it to be state-sponsored because of the victimology, what they're actually after. Again, as I mentioned, they don't want credit card information. They want a lot more than that. Uh, obviously, with the precision and the skill that this was carried out as well, we believe it to be state-sponsored. Uh, these actors were responsible for the first publicly confirmed case of a DNS registry compromise. So that was a company called Netnod in Sweden. Uh, that's public information, so we're not divulging victims or anything like that. Uh, Netnog came out in uh, January, wasn't it? I think. Yeah. I can't remember the date off the top of my head, but Netnog came out to basically say they've been a uh, victim of a sophisticated attack, which had caused DNS redirection and DNS hijacking. So really quickly, uh, register our registries and registrants because everyone confuses these, and we do as well. So the registry is the organization that owns the TLD. So for example, .com is managed by VeriSign. So VeriSign then nominate registrars, so that is someone like GoDaddy, who can then sell a .com domain or another TLD. Unfortunately, we've got these CC TLDs now, so .club, .sport, .website, .junk, everything else that comes with it. And these are all passed down through registrars. So GoDaddy, for example, sells Canadian domain names. A registrant would be me, Paul, or anyone in the room that buys a domain. Obviously, with GDPR and who is privacy, the registrant becomes less and less important because everything that you look for now from a malware point of view is generally who is protected. So it's no longer an advantage to track registrants anymore because, I mean, we used to do it as well for some actor tracking. Some actors were stupid and used to use the same email, so you could track domains fairly easily, but that's becoming more and more difficult. But yeah, I just, I just wanted to quickly point out what sea turtle are going to be compromising and attacking here. They're going to be compromising registrars to get access to registries to then use credential harvesting and theft on registrants. So we're going to say these a few times, but so just a, a quick overview. Um, so the methodology, I'll go on to the graph next, but essentially what we're saying here is sea turtle gained access to an entity, either via public exploit or via credential harvesting previously carried out, um, stolen credentials, things like that. They then were able to exfiltrate material out of their infrastructure, out of their network, and then they were able to access the DNS registry via those compromised credentials. Once they did that, they then passed out a malicious name server change. Name server change apologies. So how that really looked was initial compromise was carried out. Um, we did see some publicly disclosed exploits. Uh, I think there was nine in total that we had identified that Sea Turtle had used. That once again proves that you don't need to write zero days to get into infrastructure of any company in the world. These guys get into some very interesting pieces of infrastructure using very well-known publicly accessible exploits that are out there. These guys were very good at what they do, but they didn't need to write zero days. They didn't need to burn energy trying to find new zero days. Stuff was already there in the form of publicly known exploits. Um, Drupal Geddon, for example, was one of them used. I think this is another real cry from everyone in the security research community. Just patch. Just have a little bit of patience and patch and do the things you need to do. So yeah, they got in. Um, they then started to organize and realize the network infrastructure that was in play. Uh, the reason they did that is they wanted to perform lateral movement, ideally to try and find name servers and registry panels and perform credential harvesting. So all this credential harvesting that was carried out and all this understanding of their network infrastructure allowed them to then access the registry C panels. So as I mentioned, registrar, registry, registrant. This is the company like GoDaddy, who you can then go in and repoint your domain name servers to. So C Turtle got in, went and found the registry C panel credentials, most likely of a DNS administrator somewhere or an administrator within that infrastructure, and then logged on to that C panel and changed the details. So that was a methodology that they used to perform basically the access of getting the endpoint and I access their malicious name server. So when they done that, what did they do? Again, there's a graph here that I'll step you through, but really quickly, the victim of the endpoint sends a DNS request. The malicious name server now gives back different information in terms of falsified A records. That then lets the actor carry out man-in-the-middle attacks. So if you're not familiar with a man-in-the-middle attack, it's essentially the actor being able to look at the traffic and change it if they wish or send it on to somewhere else if they wish. Uh, the victim would enter credentials into the man-in-the-middle controlled server. That man-in-the-middle controlled server would then harvest those credentials, i.e. domain credentials that they wanted access to, and then they would pass on the victim's credentials to a legitimate service the victim would then be logged in and everything would look fine. So from the victim point of view, this is very hard to detect. Uh, so again, how does that look? 
malicious name server passes back the information after the victim asks for a request. So in this case, it was a lot of VPN and email platforms. Again, very similar to what Paul talked about around DNS espionage. VPNs and email platforms are, are really interesting places to get into because VPNs will let you access to untrusted information that you generally can't get to, and then emails are really good to read and take more information from. So the victim would ask DNS for an update, and the server get information, blah, blah, blah. We would then get an output to a malicious system where we had generally a let's encrypt or a stolen certificate, so an X509. And that would then be used in a model middle platform, and then the actor would push them onto a legitimate system. So again, from a victim's point of view, the, the victim is totally happy, because the victim typed in the details, they logged in, and they got to their service. So everything was good from the victim. Like You would not have known sitting here typing things in. Uh, everything was good. As I say, these actors are, are really quite smart in how they do this. So the victimology, when we first released this, looked a bit like this. So we had some secondary and primary targets. Um, as you can see, most of them around Middle East, North Africa type region. A um, couple sort of fallen into Europe with Cyprus and Albania there, uh, in that sort of region. So this is how victimology looked around April 2019 when we published this. Um, generally what happens when you publish a report aimed at nation state actors like this, generally what happens is they slow down. These guys just went, let's do more! And they went off and did more that we're going to see in a moment as well. But th these guys had no concern at all that we published all their information, all their IOCs, all their methodologies, how they went about DNS hijacking. We equipped both Cisco customers and um, the, the people of the world with the ability to detect these guys. Some people did, some people didn't, but they were able to continue on. They, they had no concern at all as to what was happening. This was very heavily reported in the press. Um, again, they didn't care. Yeah, cool. and for this stuff, there is something really funny. Is is it so don't care about publication that after the first publication in April, they start to read our blog post with one of the IP used for the DNS hijacking. So <laughs> I they use the IP like as a that. proxy to read our blog post. So <laughs> it was a clear message. Shh, they might be in the room. <laughs> Maybe. Hopefully not. Um, so yeah, that, that didn't happen with CTOR. They just didn't care. Again, that just points to the nation state because they have nothing to lose. You can't get extradited from your own country because your own country will never let you go if it's a country. Um, so what, what really did we want to continue with? Um, we'll talk about some of the more up-to-date victimologies that we discovered in, in another post we did in July. Um, these guys are much more aggressive than anyone really out there in terms of what they're trying to do. DNS is a, a real core infrastructure to the entire internet. Had these guys not have been as good as we believe they'd be, they could have easily broke the internet. Um, they obviously compromised the root server. That could have filtered out through the internet. Domains could have been broke around the world. The biggest problem that comes with that is everything that you do, I mean, I see people on their phones now, everything that you do there is related to DNS and domains. So if you can't look up a domain, you can't do anything. If your company can't look up a domain, they probably can't pay you because they use a payment system. If I walk into the bar next door, to buy a drink. I probably can't pay because it uses DNS somewhere along the lines to contact a communication server. So this for us is really a, a clear indication that these guys were careful and precise, but they could have easily destroyed the entire backbone of the internet, in our opinion. Um, they did this again, as I mentioned, multiple registries, registrars, TLDs, GTLDs, etc. Um, the important thing here is they wanted a clear path to DNS manipulation. Uh, they wanted to be able to control name servers. They wanted to be able to control C panels to do registry changes. They wanted the whole shooting match, and they got that generally. Uh, they did certificate abuse. So obviously, self-signed certificates and domain validated certificates are very easy to get. Let's encrypt make that very easy. What Sea Turtle also did is they stole um, legitimate certificates from infrastructure that they had compromised so that they can re reuse those certificates outside of actor or sorry outside of your own enterprise so you would go to a domain and if you were maybe a little bit more savvy than the everyday person you maybe would check the certificate because maybe you thought it loaded slower or maybe something didn't seem right well the certificate was completely valid yeah it's for example if you use ssl pinning on your vpn client for example uh, the pinning will say it's, it's a good certificate because it's the good certificate in this case they install it use it and it's impossible to check if uh if it if it's a real one yeah you can check but it's a real one in this case again that allows them to do man the middle and traffic gen or traffic manipulation as well because they can now look at the traffic that the user believes to be secure because it's within an ssl or https connection 
using um, certificates like this means you're able to actually look into it if they wanted. So we increased level of difficulty for an end user. Uh, I mean, it is a lot of these attacks that we see nowadays are increasingly difficult for end users. So yeah, as I mentioned, we, we thought, great, we've disrupted these guys, everything's good, we can go back to something else. Uh, that, that didn't happen, as we discussed. So July 2019, we started to see them do a couple of different new techniques. The biggest one was single-use name servers. With the previous campaign, they used multiple name servers for multiple um, multiple attacks. So one company would maybe have one name server, another company would have the same. So you were able to do a bit of tracking, uh, a bit of actual research around some of those domains and some of the name servers they used. In July 2019, they changed that, and so it was one-to-one. -one. So if you didn't understand that that victim was a victim, you probably didn't understand that the DNS server was a, a hijacked or manipulated DNS platform. This made it really difficult for us, but we were able to track down two, I think, at the time. Um, this makes tracking really difficult. They were less than 24 hours they were live for. So a, a lot of this data we were able to pivot from passive DNS uh, through our own umbrella platform and through Farsight passive DNS. Uh, really interesting if you're into DNS research at all. They're, they're both very, very cool platforms to start with. So yeah, as I mentioned, they were live for less than 24 hours. Again, they focused around the Middle East and North Africa. And then one very interesting non-profit organization in Switzerland. So our map became a bit like this. We had some new companies around Switzerland, um, Sudan, Cyprus. Uh, the company in Cyprus is really, really interesting, actually. So we won't talk about it, but if you go on and, and have a look at companies who work with DNS or work with um, internet connectivity around Cyprus, you'll, you'll see a very interesting attack there. Uh, we don't talk about it, obviously, as I mentioned, but if you go and have a look, you'll we'll probably be able to find it. Uh, and again, another new target in the U.S., so these are new victims that we identified. As I say, we only identified a handful at the time because you had to know the victim, to know the DNS infrastructure. It became a lot more difficult to determine. So they were to be used, as I mentioned. Um, they went off in 2019. Uh, they started to hijack a lot more, as we've seen. They started to use new techniques. Uh, they threw caution to the wind because they, they just didn't care. It was as simple as that. They were attacking a, a clear underpinning of the entire world's DNS infrastructure. They had no no problem with this at all. Uh, they weren't very amused when they when we discovered them. As Paul mentioned, they started reading our blog, so I'm sure they read our second blog, and they didn't stop there either. Uh, they continued to attack. Uh, if you feel like you maybe have been compromised with this, uh, please do talk to us because we we have some very good information on this, and we would love to work with you. And one thing, just to sort of summarize, Sea Turtle. It's not the same actor as DNS manage. I know I mentioned that at the start, but it's really important that you understand these are distinctly different actors, uh, both after maybe similar gains, but one much better than the other. Uh, we, yeah, have, we, we, we can consider that uh, DNS espionage is a little bit a low-cost version mm. of what they, they do. And, and typically, they have issues with SSL pinning because they use Let's Encrypt and, and stuff like that. And just before you start asking... Uh, sea turtle is not a magic name for attribution. It's simply one of the researchers that work with us was looking at documentary about sea turtle when we started to work on that. So it's not a, 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 a magic word to say to you it's this or this uh, attribution. No, it's simply like that. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, we always have the question. So. <laughs> Uh, let's speak a little bit about protection because we, we, we describe a lot of stuff, but uh, the U.S. homeland security, a uh, few days, weeks after our publication, uh, published an emergency directive. Uh, so it's not a recommendation, it's a directive. Uh, you must do it if you are concerned. And uh, uh, it's, it's nothing really complicated and, and obviously you can go back on a TC host file. <laughs> you won't have any problem with DNS, but uh, is it mentioned some really logical and really easy stuff you should do even on on, a, on other topic? First thing, monitoring, because usually you monitor external DNS. You monitor what you are afraid about. You monitor internet, but you don't really monitor your own DNS because it's your DNS. You know they are safe. But you should monitor your DNS. You should monitor what happened on your DNS. If you have a DNS modification, if it's normal, if it's not normal. And we recommend to use a third party, uh, passive DNS and not only your own. 
because if it's compromised then you use it to discover if it's compromised uh, it's not the best design does anyone monitor dns servers In internal dns so, server. so you can see yourself there's like a, such a small percentage of people and we're all security researchers so you would assume that we do but it, it sometimes can be very difficult because of space but if you can please try and do it it's a it's an absolute gold mine of activity yeah, and something easy you can do with uh, uh, SSL transparency is to check if a certificate is created with the name of your entity. Uh, if it's you, okay. If it's not you, you have a big issue because, for example, for Let's Encrypt, you must have the control of the DNS to create the certificate. So if someone creates a certificate for your entities, it means he has the control of your DNS. For example, it's, it's really easy to monitor with a tra SSL transparency uh, uh, organization. Other thing, uh, two-factor authentication. It's not bulletproof, but it's a new step for the attackers. He need to deal with uh, two, uh, the multi-factor authentication, which is not yeah not bulletproof, but it's more work for 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 the attackers. Yeah, patch of course. Uh, in this case, we discovered that uh, a sea turtle actor exploit vulnerability from 2009. It was released in 2009 and not patched uh, this year. So yeah, patch your system, uh, especially if it's front web, of course. Uh, revoke and reset. So if uh, something, if one of your certificate is compromised, revoke it, because uh, you you really need to uh, rebuild your uh, SSL infrastructure from scratch. Because if he has that, yeah, everything is dead. Uh, and start to to investigate how things happen. And feel free to call us if you need uh, help or, or or whatever. We will be happy to to help you for. For, for this task, at least with uh, information, then if you need really incident response, we can we can help you for, for that. Feel free to, to call us if, if you have suspicions. So that's all for us. Yeah, if you have questions, accept attribution, feel free. Yes, accept attribution, please. <laughs> no questions, our favorite. <laughs> So who did it? Yeah, there's a real question here. Oh, we got one. Who is first? <laughs> first means there's more than one. I don't like this. This is a bad crowd, Paul. Uh, kind of scary to think about what the implications of this type of attack could be. I, I wonder how air traffic control systems would be affected, for example. Um, so you said that they didn't compromise a root server. But what I heard you say was, imagine what would happen if they they did. Did I hear that correctly? Sorry, no, um, I maybe no. misspoke. They didn't compromise root servers in this attack. Well, Sea Turtle didn't. They compromised. It was the first public register to ever be compromised. Sorry, you're quite right. NetNod in Sweden, that was. Uh, there was no root servers compromised. Right, so, but, but had they compromised the root server? Had they have then? Yeah, I mean, exactly what you're saying. Our traffic control is a great example. Okay. Um, so, like, with the shift toward... Um, DNS over HTTPS uh, and the sort of centralization no. that will be affecting a lot of people in the world, doesn't that sort of create a target of similar proportion as a root server? <laughs> do I, I don't know what's going to happen with Do, obviously. So uh, Do may become the de facto standard. It may not. I don't know what the, the outcome of Do is going to be. But ultimately, if you place a centralized environment with really important information, particularly important information that can be manipulated, then you, you, you basically set up a crown jewels artifact. I don't know whether that will happen, but that's a, it's a very good point. If Do becomes a very centralized platform as they intend it to be, then yeah. That could happen and that could be... Fair. <laughs> yeah. Yay, go ads! <laughs> Um, you just mentioned um, watch your certificate transparency stuff, watch your Let's Encrypt stuff. Um, would be Let's Encrypt easier to compromise than other conventional? No, I, no. there is no <coughs> compromise. Uh, they use Let's Encrypt on, on purpose, you know, it works like that. The purpose of Let's Encrypt is to easily create certificate. So if the attacker wants to easily create certificate, he uses Let's Encrypt. Yes. Okay. I'm, I'm sorry. Um, would it, is it easier for them to use Let's Encrypt than uh, it's cheaper and easier? Cheaper. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 
But it doesn't mean let's encrypt is bad, you know. It's simply it's here, it works, they use it. Like everything. Mm. If it's easier and it works. And then a lot of platforms like CertBot for script yeah. generation. And stuff. you have script to automatically yeah. renew the Hello. certificate, extract. Uh, very good talk. Thank Rick you. from Malmar Mustai. Two questions. Um, I'd like to know when were the, when was the earliest timing that you started to figure about the, this uh, phenomena in the early beginning? The, say it again, sorry? The earliest time of? When you first start to detect Oh, so DNS espionage? Was, yes, in the uh, DNS purpose. Yeah. yeah, DNS espionage, it was... Uh, November 2017? Yeah, in November, something like that. Is there I, any possibility that coming from the 2016, actually? Uh, I saw stuff from 2017 I by see. looking on the past. But it's... yeah, Maybe it was before I simply don't have a vlog, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so, as far as... I read. <laughs> uh, it's it's 2017. Okay, but maybe before, yes. Okay. Second question is: uh, I, I think this is a very uh, severe kind of attack that cannot be, you know, uh, mitigated by the, you know, a victim's basis only. Probably, is there any way that the registrar can do something about this? Yeah, it's the same thing. It's complicated because. Uh, you know, DNS is designed to be dynamic, you know, change IP, extra, and they simply use feature. Mm. So, in this case, uh, it mainly targeted government, so by monitoring government, and, I, and even it's complicated because I spend a lot of time on that. And, for example, I thought that you are military for government, and I said, okay, your mail server is located, is in your country. Which is in fact wrong. I discovered that some country <laughs> yes, use right. AWS, for example, <laughs> for military email. So even if you say, okay, my algorithm is if a sensitive, uh, gateway of government is located on another country during few minutes, there is an issue. But I have a lot of false positives by doing that. So monitoring is really complicated because people do really creative stuff with DNS. On purpose. Yeah. What I'm asking uh, this uh, because of uh, Olympic will be coming soon in our country here. So uh, we, we try to uh, hooking as many much uh, domain as possible. But uh, do you have any better idea? Yeah. To be honest, no. Okay. And even uh, nobody asks a question. I'm surprised. But uh, each time we have, yeah, you have DNS sec. <laughs> And the point if, if you look at C Turtle, they, they, um, they still certificate. So if you use DNSSEC and they steal your certificate to, to manipulate the DNSSEC, uh, it's the same thing. It's more complicated for the attackers. It's a new step. It's a new stuff to do. But, uh, from what we, we saw, he, he's used to play with this kind of stuff. It's simply maybe, uh, the cost is more. But it's not bulletproof. So I don't have a magic solution. Uh, I will be a millionaire, you know. Uh, but yeah, making stuff more complicated uh, and monitoring if something goes wrong. Because monitoring is easy. Monitoring your DNS is easy. Uh, monitoring if someone creates certificate, it's easy. Mm. And I think monitoring is the best way to, not to stop, but at least to discover there is something wrong before, uh, before he's doing that for years and stealing a lot of stuff. Yeah, it's, it's very hard to proactively detect some of this stuff. Most of this is reactive research. Um, monitoring is still after the fact. Yeah, the so thing is, uh, there are so many things to be monitored, and then, uh, still the registrar has no yeah. idea what the stopping for those kind of uh, you know new domains uh, being registered. So if the, the adversary is trying to flood us more and more with a similar kind of the domain for the service that doesn't be existed yet, like the Olympic, for example, but this I mean, is going to be a very good, uh, big problem. The, the registry should probably be agnostic anyway. It's, it's your solution at the end of the day. I want to go in and create a domain, an IP, a name server, whatever. The registry is a, a conduit to allow me to do that. It's difficult. I think you work for a registry, I'm guessing. Uh, maybe you don't, but I'm guessing you do. Um, I'm working the cert. Yeah, oh, for cert, okay. So like, if you work at a registry, it's a bit like Cloudflare. You're getting data from one point to the other. Yes, there may be data in there that's not allowed or malicious, but that's not really your concern. So from a registry's perspective, it's very difficult for the registry to step in to provide some sort of mitigation against this because the registry is providing a feature that you're using 
yes, it's a malicious actor, but it's still a feature that the registry provides to a, a group, an individual, whatever. So it, it's it's very difficult from a registry perspective to stop it as well. I don't think there's a bulletproof answer to it, to be honest. I mean, simple things like TFA might make it easier, but... <clears throat> Thank you very much uh, for you. the talk and the contributions. More questions? If not, I have a short question. When you're compromising a root server, what would you say the level of risk in doing changes on that could be for the rest of us? How much risk were they actually putting the world at by just doing this? If you do it wrong, massive. I mean, if they do it right, probably none, <laughs> to be totally honest. If they compromise it, I say compromise it right if they carry out the redirection attack, right? But if they typo something, it could be a disaster. I mean, yeah, and in this case, from our point of view, the, the purpose was espionage. So the purpose was to don't break something. Yeah. But uh, if they want to, to, to switch off internet of a specific country, for example, from a DNS point of view, but if you don't have any DNS, it's like if it's a blackout. Uh, technically, they could do it. Yeah. They didn't want, but technically, it's, it would be possible. Uh, I see another. <laughs> um, just uh, to build on that, um, what nation state wouldn't like to have the ability to take out root name servers and just not execute that? If you weren't able to see that capability until somebody did something with it, boy, that sure would be a handy tool in the old uh, negotiating toolbox. <laughs> I mean, I, that's not a question. That's a statement of fact. And I mean, you're right. Uh, it's, it's yeah, obviously, of course it is. Yeah, I mean, if you compromise a root server, you you get the keys to the kingdom essentially for TLDs. Like if I compromise VeriSign, I can bring down a .com domain for the world. I mean, it's as simple as that, which renders, I don't know how many percentages of the internet related to a dot-com doing, but you render all that platform dead. I mean, that's why we try to point out about things like banking, uh, like simple things like how your money moves is intrinsically determined to be able to get from A to B. In general, it's DNS related. I mean, it would break some malware too, which would be cool. But, but has, I can't take in any position on this. What do you mean? Well, I mean, it's highlighting the intersection of... Uh, foreign policy and uh, <laughs> DNS, no? You mean from how government determines who controls their DNS, or <laughs> are, you, are you implying that it could be used for like cyber kinetic warfare type attacks? Because if you are, then yes, I agree with it, you. It could yes, be. Um, and I think that an open conversation around that would be healthy. You're probably right, but I don't think Paul or I are going to lead that conversation. <laughs> but I mean, you are correct. It it It, it makes you think about a lot more determined actors, what they could do if they wanted to. Uh, I mean, there only are 13 root servers. You, knew, you only need one to do a catastrophic amount of damage. Um, yeah. No, there's not. There's not. Do won't fix it. DNS sec won't fix it. Certificate pinning doesn't fix it. None of the solutions that we have in play fix it. Because again, it's like I mentioned, it's, it's a feature that you offer, so... Should we as a security community operate under a constant assumption that the root servers are actually compromised? Yeah, but you don't do anything. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> if you start like that, you, yeah. you, you will have the biggest enthusiast uh, of the world. But no. <laughs> you not leave your house because no. your phone will be broke. Your, your car, if you use a Tesla, it won't update. It might be broke. Like, I mean, you, it's, yeah, potentially, but... It's. I think that's a much more burning question when you think about root servers. Like if someone says, should you leave the room thinking that your laptop is always compromised if you're a security researcher? Yeah, you probably should. But should you leave the room assuming that the DNS root servers are always compromised? Uh, probably not. What if uh, we are all uh, doing uh, more push on the IPv6? And then uh, what do you think if uh, uh, the, 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 the implication of uh, this... Uh, Uh, threat of attack to the IPv6 uh, setting uh, uh, of uh, customer network, for example. Um, Applicable? I'm sort of trying to think of why it would make a difference. So you're just implying because you've an IP6 network, everyone has their own IP address right down to the box, and it's much easier to monitor? Or, yeah, I mean, 
Possibly. Again, it depends on what you're monitoring. If you're not monitoring those dynamic changes within your infrastructure, it doesn't matter. Um, IPv6 may make it easier to spot because you can obviously say, oh, I have a slash 64, all my boxes have an address, so it's very easy for me to see this is my DNS server, something changed. So yeah, potentially that's a, a more interesting solution to the problem, but it's still a reactive problem that you have to notice and you only do that via monitoring. I think anyway. People may disagree. And with that, we are out of time, and, and Hacklip.lu is officially over with regards to talks. We'll have the escape room prize ceremony, and then Flux Fingers will come on stage for uh, their award ceremony. So thank you, Warren. Thank you, Paul. Thank you.